Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thrilled to be here with you for Global Running Day. I'm Varn Schreer. I'm with Generation You Can, and we've really got a terrific lineup here for you today uh, in celebration of what's now become a worldwide holiday. It went from National Running Day to Global Running Day this year. And like I mentioned, you know, great series of speakers all day, but uh, we're going to kick things off this morning with Pete Ray and Ryan Warrenberg from the Zap Fitness Team USA Training Center in North Carolina. Pete and Ryan, how are you guys doing this morning? Doing well. Happy uh, Global Running Day. You guys get your running already this morning? Yeah. We did. We just we just got back. Fantastic. So uh, Pete and Ryan, like I mentioned, uh, in North Carolina, session one, uh, which is really going to deal with the mental side of running, that's what we're going to talk with uh, these two gentlemen about here today. Uh, and then throughout the day, you know, we've got a number of sessions um, that you can sign up for and tune into. We're going to be joined by Olympian Carrie Tolfson and Dr. Kathy Eckel talking about training and nutrition for women runners. That's coming up next at 1 p.m. Eastern, followed by Olympians Dathan Ritzenhine and Amy Yoder Bagley at 2.30 talking about how to train like a champion. And last but not least, 5 p.m. Eastern time, we've got Coach Greg McMillan on how to avoid the nutrition wall. But let's, um, let's before we dive into our first topic, Pete Ryan, uh, given that it is Global Running Day, how did you both get involved in the sport of running and, and what has running meant in both of your lives? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll be pretty brief. I, like a lot of folks, I started running, um, uh, in, in high school. My mother was a runner in the seventies. She started running in the mid seventies to lose weight and got into, uh, I became pretty serious about it by the 1980s. So I, uh, I wanted to emulate my mom and I was a uh, frustrated soccer player. And, uh, <clears throat> I knew that, uh, Rather than sit on the bench for soccer, I knew I could, everyone plays in running. So uh, ran in high school, was successful, ran in college, and then I ran uh, professionally, post-collegiately, uh, which is what brought me south. And, uh, and, and then from there, uh, moved into the realm of coaching and uh, now coaching full-time. As far as what running has meant to me, it's been, it's been everything. It's, uh, uh, it's what brought me to, uh, to university and uh, brought me most of my uh, – my friends, it introduced me to my wife, and uh, and now I, I get to work with runners of all ages and abilities uh, throughout the year for, for a living. Yeah, um, not not too terribly different. I got started um, with the elementary physical uh, fitness test, and <laughs> I uh, um, found out I was pretty good when we did the mile run, and I enjoyed being really good at something, and met a lot of friends just kind of getting started in the sport with cross country middle school, and kind of fell in love with it and was fortunate enough to have some really good coaches along the way that um, helped me get a lot better and enjoy the sport at the same time. And similar to Pete, you know, one of the things that's so special, I think, about the running community is the people that you meet along the way. And it's such a neat community of people. And most of my best friends in the world I've met through running. So, you know, it's, it's tough to say. I mean, it's meant a lot. It's meant a lot to me just from that standpoint that, um, I've met some really, really great people through the sport and been able to do, you know, do what I love now and, and coaching full time. So the relationships you guys both talked about, it is what makes the running community special. And, and, you know, I guess part of that is, is the people here joining us today, you know, whether they've established a relationship with you guys in the past or just interested in the topic, it's, it's cool to, to be able to bring people together from all parts of the world. So with that, guys, let's dive into the meat of our discussion today, which is the mental side of running. And, and it's actually, um, you know, something you hear about all the time in, in sports, um, these, these notions of, uh, you know, mind over matter or, or just pushing through it, digging deep. Th those are all very connected to that mental aspect of running. And that's something that you guys at Zap Fitness really preach as part of your core philosophy, right? Tra training the mind. So tell me a little bit about how much that is ingrained into your core philosophy at Zap. Yeah, I mean, you know, all coaches and programs are different, but ours, uh, you know, for those who don't know this, our program, Zap Fitness, was, was founded by my wife, Zika, and her late husband, Andy Palmer. And Andy was a PhD in sports psychology. Uh, he did his work at Florida State. Um, so from the mental side, he was one of the, uh, uh, one of the, post-collegiate professional coaches who worked a lot with athletes of all ages and abilities on the mental side as much as the physical. And over the course of the last 15 years of our club, we've uh, been fortunate to work with two great sports psychologists with our team, um, Dr. Robert Swope from Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina, and more recently over the last decade, um, Dr. Stan Beecham, who many of you may know, he wrote a book called Elite Minds, 
um, and has worked with uh, has worked with our athletes, and we've learned a lot. So I don't pretend to be a sports psychologist, but much of what we do is lessons I've learned um, through uh, through both Andy before his passing, as well as Dr. Swope and uh, and 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 Dr. Beach. So you guys uh, clearly have a lot of very credible voices uh, in that in that field that you're connected to. Um, let's start with the power of the mind. You know, thoughts and beliefs. We we there's this notion that negative thoughts can drive performance. How do thoughts and beliefs um, as a whole impact performance? Yeah, I, I think maybe I'll start and I'll let Ryan finish. You know, having been a resident pro on our team for four years, Ryan can comment more from the athlete side too. But uh, thoughts and beliefs are, are massive. Um, we get a lot of adults uh, during the summer at our adult running camps, and these are folks who were just starting to seasoned veterans as well as our pros who live at ZAP. And um, it, you get folks who really kind of fall into two categories. You get uh, athletes who are um, optimistic, tend to see what went well as opposed to what what went poorly. Um, they're goal setters and they they toe the line with the expectation of success. Um, but I would say the greater percentage, unfortunately, the greater percentage of athletes of all ages and abilities are ones who are more self-deprecating and they actually find reasons for failure. Um, or find reasons, more reasons to fail than to succeed. And, uh, and that's what we try to work with. Yeah, and I would say, to Pete's point, you know, the power for anybody stepping on a start line, um, you know, the difference between stepping on the line and expecting to succeed versus, you know, maybe hoping the, the thing is going to go well can be tremendous. And um, even moreover with what we try to do with our group of professionals um, at ZAP, and it, it translates really well to the running camps we do, um, but getting people together in a collective environment, and probably a lot of the people watching this know this even maybe outside of running. It could be in a business environment or any type of environment where you get a bunch of people in the room, and you know the people that come in and shift the energy one way or the other. And it's a really powerful thing to get people together who are shifting that, that energy in the room in a positive way. And so I think a lot of what we do with kind of the group training model that we have is try to get people together that positively influence each other. And that allows you as a group to kind of um, come together and elevate your collective performance. You know, in the middle part of, part of that is, is a lot of it. And especially at a really high level with, um, you know, with the professional athletes we work with, you know, um, those last few percentages are huge. And, you know, that mental part often can separate the people winning a gold medal from the people that are, you know, um, struggling to, uh, you know, make the, make the final or something like that. But um, it's really powerful at, at all levels, I would say. Um, you know, like I said, the people at camp come and, and they get together with those, the, the, the people that come there with that shared purpose and, and the energy is fantastic. And, and, so that translates, I think, to people in every aspect of life, but particularly in their running day to day. Um, Speaking of that, you know, that group training model, which whether it's the elite athletes at Zap or, you know, people getting together and, and training in groups, whether it's a run club or, or with running buddies, how important, like, like what you guys were just talking about, getting people that are going to shift that energy in a positive way, is, is that something that you guys take into consideration when you're bringing athletes into Zap? Yeah, it's funny you should ask that today. Right now it's springtime, so sen college seniors are uh, graduating. And uh, this year we have um, a couple of open spots on, on the team, a couple of people sort of hanging up their spikes after a long time. And so we're interviewing athletes right now. And our interview process is a unique one. Uh, but when we bring them in, you know, we one of the questions Ryan likes to ask is, what, what role do you play on your college team? Like, who are you on the team? Are you the... Are you the leader by example? Are you the rare actual leader, the one who rallies the troops sort of thing? Um, are you the kind of hide in the corner sort of person who just, just follows along? Um, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's good to hear who they are, but I call the college coaches. I want to know, you know, was this someone who elevated the team and was a positive influence or were, were they someone who drained energy? Because everyone who's listening today probably knows someone who's an energy drainer. And they're terrible. Uh, there's, they're not someone you want within your group, whether you're a pro or just in a running club. For sure. And to think that doesn't translate to performance, um, I mean, we've seen it time and time again. It, it absolutely does. So it's something that's really important for us when we're looking at potential athletes, for sure. Now, there's that aspect of, you know, thinking positively and, and believing in yourself. Uh, but I think more recently, um, 
this might have even been the other day before um, Game 7 in the NBA when I was uh, between the Warriors and Thunder when I was reading some quotes from some of the guys talking about, you know, having a healthy fear before they step onto the court. You know, kind of that that fear of failure and, failure and using that to drive them. How do you balance an athlete kind of having both, you know, that, that ability to think positively, but, but is there room in there also for fear of failure as, as a driving force? Uh, from my perspective, and I'm not sure if Ryan agrees, but I think there's a difference between um, fear of failure and being open to failure. And we talk a lot, um, you know, Bill Rogers, who won four Boston marathons, four New York City marathons. He was an Olympian, uh, third place at the World Cross Country Championships. He, you know, he's one of the greatest distance runners our country's ever seen. And recently, we've been pouring over all his training logs from the 1970s, which are amazing, by the way. Um, and everybody knows about Billy's victories, but what few people don't know is he failed, lost, dropped out of, uh, had some really awful performances throughout his career. Um, and I'm sure Billy was as tough a competitor as, as, as they come, but I don't think Billy liked to, to fail. Um, but he was open to failure because if you read his little notations, he would have bad races and I'm sure it bothered him. But by the next day he had moved on. He didn't let it, uh, he didn't let it sink in and tear him apart. And we've seen athletes who, you know, they have one or two bad races and you would think that, uh, you know, that a tidal wave is coming in to wreck your city or something. I mean, uh, it's failure is going to happen. For, for all of us, even the best athletes have bad days, bad workouts, bad races. Uh, in fact, for many distance runners, you have more bad days than you do good days. Um, so I think there's a difference between the, to your question of um, fear of failure and being open to the possibility that, you know, hey, it, it, it's, it's possible. I might, I, I might fail today uh, because I actually think on, on some level, fear, fear can be a good thing. But if you've trained the right way, uh, you'll toe the, you should toe the line with the, your best possible confidence. Yeah, and I would say maybe to continue the basketball analogy a little bit, um, <laughs> if you take, let's say, Steph Curry, and you know, I don't think that if you asked him if he was scared of missing a shot or scared of missing or losing a game, I don't think he would say, yeah. I mean, that guy, the best players in basketball, you, you hear it time and time again when you listen, like, just keep shooting, you know, just keep shooting. And those guys – I mean, maybe splitting hairs, but I don't think it's a fear of failure as much as it's maybe a fear of, you know, not doing everything they could do to win. You know, it's more of the mentality of stepping out on the court or stepping on the start line and saying, hey, there's no way I'm not going to do everything I can to succeed today. And um, that's maybe a, a little bit of a shift, but I don't think it's, it's definitely not a fear of, I mean, I guess it's a little bit of a balance, but that's the way I would categorize it maybe a little bit more is making sure that you give it everything that you have and, um, and to win the game or to do the best that you can in a race. And I will say to that point, uh, I may be jumping ahead of a future question, uh, but uh, the fear of failure you, uh, that you're talking about, I do think that that's a, uh, a huge stressor for a lot of runners and the folks we get at our adult running camps Again, all ages, 50s, 60s, people in their 70s, uh, the fear, the, the, the butterflies in the st stomach. Nervous energy can be a good thing, but it's that fine line. Sometimes too much nervous energy will really, will really, really tear you down. And I see people at the starting lines of races, and uh, you want to say, hey, look, if it's, if it's this torturous for you, should you really be doing this? Uh, racing and competing is what we work so hard for. It's why what, what to embrace. Hey, you've worked so hard, now you get to go out and, and uh, lick the icing off the cake. <laughs> And Pete, you know, to your point about uh, people kind of having that mentality, some folks uh, approaching the starting line, it, it was interesting when we were together in LA after the Olympic trials, you know, one of the things that stuck in my mind that, that Meb said um, on that panel was that by the time he gets to the starting line on race day, 90% of what's going to happen that day is mental. You know, he's put in all the training at that point. So he's confident in his body and what he's done up to that point, but it's really, you know, whether it's eliminating that fear or, or having that confidence, it's really on race day at, at that point, it's mental. Do you, do you ascribe to, to that philosophy that by the time an athlete gets to the starting line, if they've trained properly, then the majority of what's going to happen on that day is driven by the mind? Yeah. So the, I don't buy into the old cliche that it's, you know, it's 90% mental, 10% physical. I don't know what the actual percentage is, but to your point, one thing you started that sentence with was if you've done the physical, meaning as long as you've done the preparation properly, as long as you can open your training log, and this is I'll get to this later, uh, I know we'll talk about this, but if you can 
make an honest assessment of your fitness and open up your training log and say, okay, I've done all the things I was supposed to do. I've followed the training program. I've listened to my coach. If you have a coach, um, I've done it all at that point. Yes. It's as much about, um, uh, getting, getting it done upstairs, but it's a big one on, on the physical preparation too. Cause you can't, you can't fake that. But we talk, yeah. We talk about that all the time. Um, the med put it perfectly and you get that more with experienced runners, I think, but you kind of have to separate mentally um, how you're going to go about breaking down the race from all the stuff that you've done ahead of time and the mentality coming to the start line. That's exactly right. What Meb said, I've already done all that stuff. So there's nothing to be, I can't get more prepared. Hmm. There's nothing to be anxious about. Like that's, that's in the past. And now all I have to do is go out and execute whatever plan I have. And that's, that's sort of a different part of the mentality, but in terms of tempering that anxiety heading to the start line, I think that's really, really critical. Good stuff, guys. It's, it's fascinating to hear your, your perspectives on, on all those things. Um, let's transition a little bit to, to goal setting. So, you know, it's something that's, that's so ingrained um, for a lot of runners, you know, always kind of looking towards that next goal, whether it's qualifying for Boston, focusing on that next PR. Um, there's definitely some specifics we want to dive into uh, in terms of goal setting, but, but as a whole, um, you know, how important do you feel like it is for athletes to have those concrete goals that they're chasing? Uh, it, immensely important. And uh, Dr. Uh, Keith Henschen is a psychologist, uh, sports psychologist who uh, worked with a lot of NBA teams, mainly the Utah jazz, but he also does a lot of corporate work. And years ago I was at a USA track and field coaches clinic and, he was talking about actually not sport, but business and the people who set business goals, you know, whether it's sales goals or um, performance goals um, for, for shares and um, in sport and in business, the, those who set goals, even if you don't attain those goals, um, almost always perform better. And the, uh, and I have to say this, the overwhelming majority of our, of the folks who come to our running camp don't, don't set goals. Um, and it's one of the things we with, that we work with them on is, Hey, have goals. Um, if you, uh, maybe it might just be a fitness goal. I know everyone's goals are not performance based. Maybe it's a fitness goal, a weight loss goal. Um, but if you have performance based goals, especially if you lay out and set those goals in different tiers. And what I mean is have your, you know, you might call it your platinum goal. You know, like if all goes well and I have the perfect day and it's, uh, I get a, I get a 50 degrees, no wind, no humidity kind of day. Maybe I can do this. Um, I'd be satisfied. It'd be a good day if I did this and then, you know, Hey, I can, I can live with this, you know, tier C or maybe it's the bronze medal goal. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so setting goals is an important thing and, uh, our athletes do, and they make them public. They put them on boards inside our, inside our, uh, our dining room at down at, down at Zap Fitness. And, and on that point, Pete, uh, the, the making the goals public, is there, um, a notion that you guys have uh, that, when goals are expressed out loud, people are more accountable. Yeah. I think that that's true. And, and um, I've heard people go both ways with this professional people say it can be good or it can be bad, but I would say specifically with our athletes, um, you know, part of the reason they're at Zap training together, you know, we have about 10 to 12 athletes at any given time. And um, I talked about earlier the idea that, um, you know, everybody can come together and, and uh, raise the, raise the bar for the entire group. And, and so making those goals public, I think is important when you're surrounded by teammates who are there to help lift you up. And we try to bring in those people who want to be there for their teammates to help pull them along when they're having a bad day or help lift them up when their spirits are down. Um, and if you get enough of those people together, I think it, I think it is really important to say, Hey, here's what I want to do. And if you're having a cruddy day one day, then you've got a teammate who knows what your level of expectation is and what it is that you're looking to do. And they can help lift you up on a day where maybe you're feeling a little down or, you know, not quite up to, you know, maybe your energy is not quite, quite where you need it. So I would say specifically in that environment, um, that's a big reason why we do that. Now you Pete, like when you were talking about the weather and, and, you know, different things that can impact a race, you know, certainly there's a lot of factors outside of just, individual preparation, um, that especially when we're talking about the marathon, but I guess for any race, but you know, there, there's a lot of things that can come into play. Um, and I guess with some of those factors, you know, things can be out of your control when there's a specific goal in mind. How do you distinguish between 
a process goal versus an outcome goal? Maybe that's something that, that you could explain to the audience. And, and how are those different? How should people think about those differently? Yeah, so I, I actually think if, uh, if, if your viewers take away nothing other than what, we're, what Ryan and I are about to say, it's probably the most powerful thing, which is, you know, we li- it's a Western culture. We live in a Western culture where almost everything is outcome-based. You know, did I, did I break that seven-minute mile or didn't I? You know, did I break that four-hour marathon or didn't I? So it was either success or failure. Um, but what we talk to the athletes about is actually process goals too. So the, a process goal is a goal that you can control eh, for the most part. Uh, I made sure that I was drinking between 80 and 90 ounces of fluid each day. Um, I am getting eight and a half to nine hours sleep every night. Uh, I get a massage once every 10 days. They're, they're quantifiable and controllable goals. You know, uh, maybe you have issues with low iron, which is a huge issue for a lot of distance runners is low iron. So, you know, you take your iron supplement four to five days a week of 200 milligrams of ferrous sulfate or whatever it is. Those are quantifiable, controllable, and it's, you can literally, if you want to, put it on a checklist, on a piece of paper each day, check, 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 check. And if you get to race day, you get to the uh, Twin Cities Marathon, and uh, you can look at your log with your process goals. If you've done all those things, the likelihood that you'll get the out- outcome goal, it's more likely to happen. Is it certain to happen? No, but it's more likely to happen. But we don't focus enough on the process. We, we typically, as a culture, focus just on the outcome. And I think that can be, that's the thing where a lot of people, I think, get themselves in trouble is if you're, uh, you know, for, for the sake of an analogy, if you're standing at the bottom of a staircase and you're looking at the top stair going, that's where I want to get to, you're not going to jump from the first floor to the second floor all, in a, all in, a, in a blink of an eye. And I think a lot of people, that's the easiest thing to say is I want to, I want to do this. Um, but what you really need to focus on in order to make that happen, you've got to focus on all those stair steps along the way. And if you can do that day in and day out and, hey, I got my run in today, I got that work in, out in today, you know, I went to bed early because I knew I had to get up for my long run, those things are, are critical because it becomes a lot harder to s- start at point A when you're trying to get to point B and say, gosh, how am I going to get there? And it's easy to blow off a run. It's easy to blow off the little things because that gap seems so insurmountable. But if you can say, hey – I'm just going to take one step in the right direction today. What do I need to do in order to do that? That becomes a lot more manageable and something that you can sort of put the blinders on and say, okay, I can accomplish that today. And I know that that's going to help me get here, but you need to spend a lot more time focusing on those individual steps, those process goals, than focusing on the outcome goals. Those are important, but if you spend all your time thinking about this, it becomes very hard to take those steps along the way to get there. Ryan, to speak to that point, you know, we see this, uh, and maybe this is how it happens as well as at, at the elite level, but, you know, with the, with the age grouper or, or the, the everyday runner training for, for races, you know, if that PR goal isn't accomplished in one race, it's immediately like, okay, what's the next race I can schedule? What's the next race that I can, you know, chase that PR on? How do you advise runners balance that, you know, that desire to, to keep racing, keep racing, keep chasing that PR versus really stepping back and saying, how can I focus on some of those process goals and achieve certain things in training that's going to set me up better to PR at that next race? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think some of it comes down to uh, consciously being aware. Sometimes it's where a coach can be really helpful to say, hey, we need to take a step back because, I mean, in, the, in different races are, are different. The marathon in particular is one where you see that a lot where, gosh, you go get a hot day and – you run 15 minutes slower than you were hoping to. And, and really it's nothing of your own fault. It's just, that's the reality of the day. And I see a lot of people who say, I'm going to run one. You know, I know I'm fit to do this. I'm going to come back in three weeks and try to run a fast one. And that distance in particular is one where it's really difficult. And, you know, frankly, a little bit dangerous in terms of risking some injury to be able to do that. Um, if you have a couple of, sometimes you can have like a couple of marathons, maybe, a couple weeks apart and if it's going to be 90 degrees say hey I'm gonna I'm just gonna do the second one I'm gonna have a plan B um, I know logistically that can be impossible sometimes but that's the way to do that particularly at the marathon distance for some of the shorter distance races if you're running a 5k or 10k it's good to have a few of them on the schedule anyways and you know like I said if if you're doing a good job with the process goals and you can honestly look and say I'm doing all the right things. I know that performance is there. It just didn't 
you know, maybe there were some things outside of my control that didn't play out the way that they should have on that day. I'm going to get it next time. And that goes to Pete's point about Bill Rogers saying, hey, bad day. The next day, I'm right back into taking care of those steps. And I'm going to brush that off because I know that I'm putting in the work. And I have the confidence in my ability and the confidence in what I'm doing to say, you know, it was just one of those days and I'm going to go, I'm going to be better the next time out. The marathon's a little bit trickier, you know, um, just because of the recovery process that's involved coming off one. Um, but outside of that, you know, moving on, and even if it is a marathon, kind of being able to say, hey, you know, it was a bad day. I'm going to be better the next time. It's really important for a runner of any, any, any level, honestly. And I think it's worth noting, this is just something that we talked about a little bit at the Olympic trials in LA. You might remember, and I may be jumping forward to another, another question, but is what I see right now, if it's a small mistake that a lot of folks make of all ages and abilities now in running is that they assume that every race has to be a PR. Um, that every race is that like, Oh man, that, that race was 30 seconds slower. I'm taking a step backwards. Um, you know, you, you typically can ride two or three peaks a year in terms of your fitness. So it's okay. If you're looking to run a 20 minute 5k and occasionally you, you know, your goal is to break a 20 minute 5k for the year, let's say that's your outcome goal. And you occasionally run, you know, 20, 40, or maybe it's even 21 minutes. Like it's not a disaster. Keep going. And also when you're starting racing, like let's say you're really targeting this 10K in, you know, Portland, Maine in June. Um, as you build in, you know, run some lower key races to get started. Run some ones on hillier courses where you, you know you're probably going to run slower. Everything doesn't have to be uh, a PR. You don't have to hit a home runner every time, you know. Swing for some singles um, and, uh, and, and you'll find that you'll actually – get fitter and fitter and fitter. If you assume that every single race has to be a PR, it's a tough road and uh, very few people can succeed in, in that realm mentally. Hey, one, one, one other thing, if you don't mind me saying this, back to our goal setting thing, I just wanted to give you one of the perspectives we have with our adult campers uh, is that I actually think that most people set their goals to, uh, uh, don't set their goals lof lofty enough. Um, within almost every camp we'll sit down and we do a little individual end of camp like hey what are your goals and how can we do that session and uh it always blows my mind uh that the people will would, would prefer to set their goals uh in the middle than set 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 uh reasonable optimistic goals we had a lady in this last camp last week you know she uh ran 313 in her debut marathon which is exceptional uh it's unheard of really and you know she's only running about 40 or 45 miles a week which is not a lot for a marathoner and you know she said she was hoping to break 310 which is three minutes faster and you know i started ripping my hair out and thinking geez i i think you're gonna run 20 minutes faster than that in the next uh in the next couple of years uh and I, I know people i think are sometimes afraid of what they really can do but i find that people actually tend to set their goals uh a bit too modestly and Pete, that's that's an interesting point. So, kind of with the folks that you've you've had discussions with this about, why why do you think that is? Is it uh, because people are looking to be able to achieve the goal they set, or or are people, you know, afraid of kind of missing their goals? What what do you think that the psychology behind that is? Yeah, well, Stan Beecham, our uh, the sports psychologist we've worked with, has said time and time again that. People, are, people are, are, are indeed afraid of failure, but all, often sometimes they're afraid of success as well, that if, the, if you continue to succeed, um, maybe the expectations will be too much. If you keep improving and improving, that there'll be greater expectation. Um, and uh, I, I, I still believe, and I've seen, most athletes will perform better if you set a lofty goal and, and target that, even if you slightly miss it, than if you just set the goal in the middle where you where one that you know you'll succeed at. Um, I think there, I mean, this, I think that there's a little bit of vulnerability involved too. And I'm going to make a weird analogy, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think a little akin to being afraid to ask out the girl in high school for fear of putting yourself out there and getting rejected, you know, to say, Hey, I have really high expectations for myself and I'm willing to put myself out there and see what I can do. And the higher the level, the higher the expectation, probably the greater chance for failure. And so it's along the same lines, but I think that idea of, you know, really putting yourself out there and saying, hey, this is what I'm going to put myself out and, and see what I can do and be really honest about it. 
you know, there's a there's an element of vulnerability there that I think people are um, a little hesitant or a little resistant to. Whereas it, if it's I'll set it set it down that that bar a little bit lower, make it a little bit easier, and then say, hey, maybe I could have done more. You know, even if it's just internally, I think. Um, but my experience would be setting that bar high and you know being a little bit more vulnerable with that goal. Even if you're not, even if you don't quite get there, I think people come away feeling more satisfied for. Um, you know, exploring what it's like to um, really put themselves out there like that. And I think, you know, um, that's a lot more powerful at the end of the day, even though it's a lot harder, I think, for people to do at the, the start of the process. Yeah. And you'll find, um, just for your, for your viewers, you'll find that there are, there are folks who will be threatened by your lofty goals. It's a common thing. You hear it a lot that if you're someone who has lofty goals and you make them public, like, hey, I'd really like to see if I can I don't know, uh, run under 40 minutes for that 10 K that you'll find that there are those who will question you. Yeah. You really think you can do that? Um, that's something that my wife Zika dealt with when she was, uh, sort of really improving in her first uh, six or seven marathons. Um, but, uh, gotta keep, gotta keep believing in yourself and making sure you surround yourself with people who believe in you. And I think Pete, to speak to that point, you know, especially this day and age with, with social media, it's, it's so much easier when you make your goals public to have, a much wider audience have access to it. And it may not always be people that, you know, know you well or, or, or are that closely connected to you. So there's probably, you know, there's probably more of that going on these days than, than ever. For sure. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I just, uh, I, I remember when, when, uh, you know, when Alan Webb was having his best year as an American miler, I mean, he's our American record holder that, uh, you know, it didn't matter what the guy did, he'd run a great race and people would say, you know, geez, it's too early in the season or he'd run a race that was slightly off and the first, the first people on a chat board would say, uh, see, he's all washed up and, and I'm sure the, those people are the people that Alan did not surround himself with on a daily basis. Absolutely. Um, so another point, you know, which I think is kind of one of the special things about running is it's so from a sports standpoint, it's so relatable uh, for, from pe for people to be able to kind of take some things away from what the elite athletes do, perhaps more so than, than any other sport. You know, I mean, we were talking before this came on is that, that we're all big basketball fans. There, there's certainly some things I could take away from LeBron James, but I don't know that I could be, you know, six, eight, two seventy and fly down the lane and, and dunk you know, like that. But with, 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 I mean, just, just a limitation. What can I say? <laughs> No. You don't set goals, Vern, clearly. That's, that's right. You know, maybe, I, maybe I'll, I'll reevaluate that statement after this session. But, um, but from an elite runner standpoint, you know, what can everyday runners replicate um, in terms of how elites train their mind? Um, I'll start with just a couple and then let Ryan jump in, which is um, one that we already talked about, which is first, have goals. Uh, set goals and have someone with who, who helps you set those goals, meaning – uh, it, it helps if there's someone who perhaps knows more about the sport than you do or an advisor. Maybe it's a, a, an actual coach. Maybe it's just someone who writes sessions for you, but someone with whom you can sit down and say, hey, let's map out a year and I want to have some, not just the process goals, but also, hey, what do you think are some reasonable and optimistic goals for me at my current level of fitness, at my, my experience, my age, um, and, the, and the things that I want to do? Um, have goals. And that's just the first step in having them. And then also the idea of having um, a plan to, toward those, those goals. Again, um, we see at a camp probably with 60 to 70% of our campers, most runners in this country go out and each week do the same, do the same thing. I run four days a week, five miles. Um, you're going to improve for a little while, but uh, you're eventually you're going to plateau. So have a plan with varying intensities. Um, uh, varying duration, varying frequency, all the things that'll uh, allow you. And once you have a plan and uh, toward how to achieve those goals, um, you'll be better served. And then the last one I was going to say is um, have a plan that's also flexible in nature, meaning a plan A and a plan B, which Ryan mentioned. And that even includes an individual race. You might have a plan for the grandma's marathon, which incidentally I think is in a couple of weeks. Um, but um, you know, what about plan B? You know, what if you get to halfway and it's, it's uh, a bit different than you and your coach um, discussed? How are you going to, how are you going to handle that? A few little truths. Yeah. And I would say maybe the most important part of it, just to start, if we're relating, um, you know, the, the everyday runner to the professional athletes is 
they all struggle with the same stuff. I, think, yeah. I, I mean, if you sit down with our athletes, the, the campers that sit down with them discover that, oh, wow, they wrestle with all the same things mentally that I wrestle with. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not that different. They may be running a lot faster, but they struggle with a lot of the same things. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is really important, you know, we talked about the idea of process goals. And one of the sports psychologists that Pete mentioned earlier that we've worked with, uh, Stan Beecham, um, has done with our athletes is say, hey, figure out the things that you need to do every day and wake up and say, okay, was today a win or was today a loss? You know, very simply, did I do what I could do to make myself better or did I not do that? And you have to be honest with yourself, you know. Um, gosh, you know, I didn't get that run in today because I forgot about, you know, the kids' t-ball game or whatever. Um, you know, be honest with yourself, but assess that on a day-to-day -day basis and just try to try to string together as many winning days as you can. And if you do that, um, you can step to the start line and, and be confident and say, hey, I've already done, like Meb said, 90% of the work. The race is really just a byproduct of what I've done over the last however many weeks. And that's something that uh, the elites struggle with too, where you know, they have pre-race anxiety. They have a lot of doubts going into races. And, and the more you can do to minimize that, um, the better off you're going to be. And I do think a lot of it sometimes is as simple as, you know, the night before the race, taking a deep breath and saying, hey, I've done all this work. And I had a college teammate of mine who was a better runner than I was, actually. And he would bring his running log with him to all the races. And he'd sit in bed at night before, you know, the night before the race. And he would just flip through his log and just read all the training that he put in, you know. And um, he worked really hard. And, and uh, so he would sit down and just reflect on that and say, and I think it just gave him confidence to say, hey, I've done everything that I can do. And now it's just a matter of kind of letting that out, you know, unleashing that in the race. And yeah, I think that's an important concept for the professionals as well as, um, you know, the non-professionals. Even though you may not have, you know, 12 hours a day to dedicate to your training the way that the pros do, is to do all those things in the process, you know, in those process goals, those day-to-day -day things, to put you in the position to step on the line and say, hey, I've done all that stuff. I'm good, you know, and now it's just a matter of going out and executing it just like, a, you know, if it's a marathon, I always tell people just it's another long run, you know, it's a scripted long run. It's a little bit faster, but if you've done the work, you're going to be fine. And having the confidence uh, to be able to do that um, is critical, but it is a byproduct of those process goals. And sometimes it just takes, you know, like I said, taking a deep breath and really just saying, kind of reflecting on, you know, the training and all the work that you've done. Um, but that's a big one, I think, is, is you do all the work and then you get anxious and your mind starts spinning a million miles an hour the day before the race or the morning of a race and just calming it and saying, no, you're fine. You've done the work. You're ready to go. And um, that's a big one, I think, for people of any level. And I would say one other quick thing um, for everyone. Um, we we talked to the athletes at ZEP about two, two approaches to, to actual racing which is avoidance or acceptance. And the avoidance people are the people who approach a race from the standpoint of a uh, gun goes off and throughout the race, no matter how you feel, you just convince yourself, I feel great, I feel, I feel great, I feel great. Um, and it's actually a bit of self-deception. And then the acceptance people uh, are the people who toe the line with, they say, okay, this is gonna hurt like hell. The next, eight minutes, 20 minutes, hour, two hours, however long the race is that you're running, this thing is going to, it's going to be torture, but I'm, I can deal with it. I'm tough. I'm going to deal with it. I can put myself through anything. And I'm not saying one or the other is more effective, but we've, we, I find that athletes who can employ one of those two strategies where you toe the line, you either convince yourself you're feeling great. I, I tend to find that the shorter the race, the more acceptance works. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, of the avoidance, uh, tends to work a bit better for, for, uh, for the longer races, basically telling yourself that you're okay with suffering for three, four, five hours in a marathon can be a, can be a tough thing to do. Really, really great points guys. And you know, we, we've got about five minutes left here. I just want to ask you guys a couple more. Um, my next question, which you, you guys already gave a few tips was really going to be, what are some mental tricks? You know, if, if, if I think people are very accepting and, and believe in what you guys are saying about, about, um, you know, training your mind and, and all the examples you've given. And, and Ryan, you know, you gave us um, the trick that your teammate used to do, which is if you put in the work, 
kind of reinforce that by reading your training log the night before the race. Pete, um, you know, you gave us just a perspective on avoidance versus acceptance. Uh, Ryan, I think you also gave us another great tip about, you know, from Stan Beach, I believe, wake up in the morning and kind of clearly identify a few goals that you want to achieve throughout the day. Are, are there any other simple tricks that, that people can use to kind of get themselves thinking in the way you guys are recommending? Yeah, I, I have just one as it relates to the tougher training sessions or races, which is something we call chunking. And uh, it's the idea that if you're running, say, a 10K, which is 6.2 miles, uh, break the race up in your mind into different blocks. So, you know, um, for example, this weekend we have three Zap uh, ladies who are running the Fryhofer's Women's 5K in Albany, New York. And um, we've already talked about, like, hey, how do you execute – that first mile, which has some uphill in it. And then how do you execute that middle mile? And then how do you, how are you going to execute the last mile? So you break it up into your head. And you know, once that first mile is over, whether you executed it perfectly or horribly, it's over, it's done with that chunks over, but focus on the next block. Um, or for people who are running marathons, you know, you sure as heck don't want to be the person who says, okay, one mile down 25 to go. Uh, it's probably the worst possible way to focus on a marathon, but it might be, hey, you know what, the first 14 miles, I'm going to focus on this, on being relaxed and controlled and running roughly these tempos. When I get to 14, that chunk is over. Let's focus on the next chunk, which is from 14 to 21, where my coach told me to do this from 14 to 21. <coughs> chunking, chunking a race was, is a nice mental trick to break your races or hard workouts into manageable segments. And the only other thing, and this is as much physical, it's kind of a physical preparation that I think impacts things greatly from a mental standpoint is practice the things that you're going to do on race day. And this is probably as important, maybe more important with the marathon than anything, but, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, making sure you're getting your fueling right. And so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, figuring out what time you need to eat breakfast before you step you know, you go out to the race, practice all the things that you're going to do. Make sure you've got the footwear that you're going to use and you've practiced with it and it doesn't bother your feet. Um, all the things that you're going to experience on race day, try to replicate those in training as much as you can. Um, you know, I think that that's an important thing to be able to reduce that level of anxiety the day of the race, especially for some of those big marathons where there's a lot of logistical aspects to it. If you can sort of eliminate things that are ancillary a little bit, it'll help a lot. And then the other thing, the only thing I was going to add real quick is just the idea of kind of controlling the controllables that we've, we've talked a lot about that, but so many people spend so much energy and so much time thinking about things that are totally outside of their control. And if you're running a marathon and it's going to be 85 degrees, that's an important piece of information. Um, but if, if you can take that information and say, okay, this is the reality of the situation. How can I best, execute a race given that this is the circumstance rather than wishing for it to be 50 because that's not happening you know um if you can spend time focusing on the things that you can control as it relates to racing or training or whatever it is um your energy is going to be much better spent on things that you can actually have an effect over rather than you know wishing away circumstances that uh you know you, you there's nothing that you can do about Guys, uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Really fun spending this morning with you. I'm going to just close it out with two two quick ones. Um, so, you know, at UCAN, we've been really excited to to partner with with Zap this year, and um, you know, really help fuel a lot of uh, a lot of the elite athletes at Zap. And you know, I know Tyler Pinnell, fifth at the Olympic marathon trials, he's had good success using UCAN. Sarah Crouch, she was uh, 11th at Boston, uh, second uh, American female overall. Um, she's also had had good success with it. What have you seen um, from a nutrition and a fueling standpoint, the impact that, that UCAN has had on, on the athletes at Zap? Yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, we could almost, in, in part, part of a way, tie it into what we're talking about from a mental standpoint, which is, you know, they use it on a daily basis. I mean, in addition to racing, you know. It's um, not just race day. Yeah. We use it every day, you know, for recovery purposes, you know, being able to go to a run and have, have a, a UCAN bar or a, a mixed drink made up. Um, to take right after they're done with their training. I mean, it's it's important for their recovery process. I think that's critical. Um, but also, you know, just from a mental standpoint, it's one of those things to check off the box and say, hey, I've done this. I have, you know, I have the you can, and now I know that it's something I don't have to worry about. You know, I'm taking care of the things that I need to take care of. And particularly when it comes to racing um, and the longer distances where fueling is an issue, being able to say, hey, I know that I don't, that anxiety of, you know, what am I going to take in? How's it going to affect my race? 
You know, am I going to have GI issues? You know, being able to have that and, and have that not be an issue that anybody's worried about and know that they're going to have that taken care of in the best way possible, I think is critical. I mean, both from a performance standpoint, but even mentally, just to say, it's not something that I need to worry about. I know that I'm taking care of what I need to uh, by doing this. I think that's been huge for, for those two athletes, but the whole crew as well. I, I, just one other thing that I don't think we talk about enough with you, Ken, which is the idea of, yes, it's uh, slow release um, fuel, so you don't have that crazy insulinary response that you have um, with a lot of the other um, uh, uh, sugar-based uh, goo packets and that sort of thing. But, uh, so it's, it's, it's a more uh, evenly dispersed energy. But especially with the, the young, the millennials, uh, the fact that it's not genetically modified, the fact that it's gluten-free, I mean, the, the young athletes really, really uh, like the fact that it's the clean burning fuel and that, uh, you know, it's not, uh, hasn't been altered 15 different ways um, uh, by, by a large company in the Midwest. So uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. I, I appreciate you guys sharing both, both those sentiments. And um, finally, to close this out, you know, there, there's... I'm sure there's a lot of people that are, that are tuning into this either live now or are going to watch this later that are like, hey, these guys are really smart. I want them to, uh, to help me improve my running. So you guys, you know, we, we've talked about the elite side of Zap, but Zap is not just a place for elite athletes to come. You know, Pete, Ryan, you guys alluded a lot to, to the campers. And, and you know, we, we had somebody from our team out at, at Zap this past weekend kind of part of the camp, getting a feel for what you guys do. And, and, you know, just really looks like a fun environment, these adult running camps that you guys put on. So how can people get involved with Zap? You know, maybe tell us a little bit about what you guys do for the everyday runner. And if people are interested, how can they be part of it? Yeah. So our adult running camps run throughout the summer um, from uh, roughly now uh, until September and, and, and October. And, uh, the camps are fairly intimate setting. A sellout for us is just 24 campers, um, men and women uh, from 20s, even occasionally the camper in their teens to 70s. I think 86 is still the oldest camper we've ever had. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's full service. We have a full-time executive chef and dining room, and uh, we have the lodge on site where they stay. It's single and double room suites. And uh, a typical day is up, light breakfast, uh, an instructional run where we might be talking about biomechanics or videoing their, uh, videoing their running form for analysis later. Uh, we do all our running in, in a national, beautiful national park on uh, gorgeous forest roads, um, lectures on everything from massage to uh, performance-based nutrition and exercise physiology and sports psychology, how to build your own training program. Uh, we've got a big, we have big bonfires at night where folks like to sit around and um, chat and have a glass of wine. Um, it's, it's adult camp. Everything's optional. We've got a hot tub. And uh, we're, we're up, Blowing Rock, North Carolina is up around 4,000 feet elevation. So it's a weird little corner of the south. It stays very cool even in the summer. And, uh, yeah, we get people who have been running for 30 years, and we get people who have been running um, – that started running a couple of weeks before camp uh, and everything in between. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And it's definitely the environment like we talked about where people come together and um, a lot of people come and they come away so much more motivated than what they were before they showed up just because of the people that they're surrounded by. So um, if you want some more information on the camps, just go to zapfitness.com. Um, and you can sign up for the camps on there. You can read more about them. Uh, you can figure out, you know, it'll, it'll tell you how you can get in contact with us if you're interested and uh, if you have some questions or anything. But, um, again, it's just zapfitness.com. And we still have some openings this summer in, in some of the camps. So, um, you know, check it out if you're interested. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, I think I'll, I'll definitely say from what I've read and what I've heard about the camps, it's a worthwhile investment. And, and I'm uh, really excited to come hang out with you guys coming up here in August and, and check it out for myself. Um, so with that, uh, that wraps up our first session. I really, really thank you guys, Pete and Ryan. Uh, it was really fun to spend some time with you this morning. And, um, you know, what I took away from this session is that I can be LeBron James. So I'm going to make sure I <laughs> set my goals. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, you guys are terrific. I think there's a lot of valuable stuff here. And um, we will be sending out this recording uh, later today to everybody who is on here live. Um, but Pete, Ryan, thank you guys so much for being part of this. All right. Uh, thank for you very us. much. And, uh, Train hard, everybody. Thank you, guys. And uh, coming up here in about 10 minutes, um, we're going to start our next session. It's Nutrition and Training Tips for Women with Olympian Carrie Tollefson and researcher from Yale University, Dr. Kathy Eckel. So we'll take a short break, and we'll be back. Pete and Ryan, thank you, guys. Have a great day. Bye.